give you what you need for the rest of the day. Amen. You ain't got to wait, but we serve an all-sufficient and a God who can give us everything that we need. Amen. All right. We're going to continue in uh, our series. If you were here last week, you remember that it got so good to me last week, I couldn't even finish the sermon. So we're just going to keep preaching through this text of James, Have You Got Good Religion? And uh, if you missed it last week, uh, we'll try to give you a little bit of an overview of what we talked about. But certainly the hope and the aspiration is to keep reminding us that uh, it matters. Your religion, your uh, practice of faith, if you will, matters. That it is not the case that we are a people who uh, want to be uh, uninterrogating that which has been handed to us, both to uh, not only um, be transformed by, but we are also stewards of the faith. Uh, none of us uh, came, well, very few of us came to faith without someone introducing us to this great gospel. It may have been your mom and them, and that could have been a problem. Your dad and them, that could have been a problem. Your, 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 your church community, that could have been a problem. Because sometimes, you know, some introductions are not always the best introduction. Anybody ever had a first impression that was not the best impression? And then it took a long time for you to, like, get one over. And be like, man, I met you for the first time, and it was not the bomb. And so now it's like you meet people and they're like, oh, do you know McBride? It's like, mm, I, met, I met him. No, he's a great guy. Oh, no. The first time I met him, he cussed at me. He, you know, cut me. It's like, oh, really? And then you got to spend a whole lot of time trying to recover, make up from the deficit of the first impression. How many know sometimes that is how our faith our religious expression can be. It can be a very huge turnoff. Uh, I think it was Gandhi that said uh, something like, I love Jesus, but Jesus followers, not so much. He wasn't talking about none of y'all though, of course. <laughs> right? <laughs> but the challenge we have in a time where uh, language and words are often used without much interrogation and without much distinction. Uh, you can say that you are a Christian and no one would really know what that means, except for perhaps a couple of culture war issues that have now dominated the discourse around what it means to be a Christian. There's some folks who feel like to be a Christian means that you got to go hard in the pain around LGBTQ people. You got to go hard in the paint around abortion. You got to go hard in the paint around being uh, American. And that seems to be the reductionist version of American Christianity. And I'm so glad that there is a wonderful, faithful expression of Christian faith that predates Donald Trump. <laughs> and Newt Gingrich and Jerry Falwell. And all these religious right folk who have bastardized a historically rich faith that has not been perfectly embodied by the followers of Jesus, but certainly this American Christianity is quite a thing. And so because it is, it is important for all of us to keep asking ourselves the old Negro spiritual powerfully says, have you got good religion? And he used to say, certainly, Lord. Then, you know, just like good old Negro spirituals, you know, they say the same thing, but just with different words. Do you love everybody? Certainly, Lord. Have you been to the water? You know, you can do anything with a Negro spiritual, praise God. You just <laughs> get you six or seven words and just plug it on in. But the questions are still profound, and they still require an answer. They still require deep reflection. And so the question, have you got good religion, is a question that every follower of Jesus ought to wrestle with. No, long, it, it, no, no matter how long you've been a Christian, a follower of Jesus in the church, I do believe at many points of your life, of your year, of your week, you need to ask yourself, do I have not good religion? I would like to say faithful 
religion. Is my following of Jesus faithful to the ways of Jesus? And it is in that way that I invite us to turn to James chapter number Oh, we were in chapter uh, number one last week, and uh, I want to get into our lectionary passage a little bit of James chapter two this week. So we'll just read a few verses from last week just to uh, keep us going, because uh, part of the uh, sermon I didn't get to, uh, I certainly want to allude to it. But there is something I think very important about the second parts of these verses as well. So let's start at verse number 19, James chapter 1, verse number 19. The scripture says like this, you must understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for human anger does not produce God's righteousness. Mm, therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. I won't get a chance to stay on this passage too long, but I will just start with this point that many of us need to take seriously. That we live in a culture that is very quick to speak very slow or unwilling to understand, and very quick to anger. We are socialized, unfortunately, to be a people that views uh, pacifiz uh, pacifism. Mm -hmm. oh, what am I trying to say? Yeah, pacifism. Yeah, to be a pacifist. Mm -hmm. When you're someone who wants to believe that uh, Nonviolence as a way of life, being against war, being against the use of force to secure an outcome is a sign of weakness. And unfortunately, this inability to hold your wrath back before it is unleashed on others is a countercultural impulse. De-escalation is not a skill set for many of us. Amen. We are even filled with the Holy Ghost and that with fire. We who follow the ways of Jesus, if we're honest, we are quite more retributive and punitive than the ideals of our Savior. And I know what it's like. I was on a panel conversation at the DNC, the Democratic National Convention with a couple people, and we were in a fascinating conversation about uh, masculinity. Because some of us were having a conversation about how difficult it is for uh, certain individuals who uh, have been raised in a predatory environment, right? Which is the neighborhood. A lot of us who grew up in uh, harsh conditions a lot of us who grow up in places and spaces where if you show signs of weakness, you will be devoured, right? I was sharing a story how growing up in the Bayview Hunters Point community, uh, even though we all church kids, we all came to church, uh, we still had to catch the bus to school, had to ride the 29 Sunset and the 15 Third and the 55 and, and 14 Mission. We ride through neighborhoods, and even though we would come to church on hmm, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and maybe something, no, maybe Saturday and Sunday too, we still had a lot of our life that we had to live outside of church. And so we were all, you know, being trained as musicians. My mom was a violin teacher and my brothers, everybody played music and I was the high pitch singing guy. And so I wanted to learn an instrument and so they started me on violin. And so, you know, we playing violin. And then my dad one day said uh, to my mom, uh, they're not doing violin no more. And you know, it you know, turned into a conversation. And I overheard my dad say something like, if these boys are riding through San Francisco carrying a violin, <laughs> they're going to be a target. And it, in you know, some decades of reflection, made me think about how young black boys cannot develop the softer side of their life because it is dangerous to even show that 
you have a part of you that is not harder than a rock. And then if you grow up and you experience trauma because of the hardness that you've had to use to survive, and some of these brothers, formerly incarcerated guys, were recounting all the ways in which they had to cope with violence and with uh, uh, physical and bodily harm by the police, by people in their communities when they were incarcerated, et cetera. And then they're expected to show up in a meeting and talk softly all the time. When they get energetic, they can't use their hands and raise their voice because all of a sudden they're considered to be aggressive. And then they get described as toxic. And you should have seen some of these brothers' faces just becoming literally overrun with anguish that in this political environment, they don't feel like anyone's listening to them because they talk too loud or even because some of the things they say are not always backed by sound information. And it was a very interesting conversation. It made me think a little bit about what is at stake for us if we don't learn how to become people who can be slow to anger, who can slow down our emotional uh, acceleration, if you will, to not be the first ones to go off. Oh, I'm going off. You got me messed up. Not today, right? Is it a value for us to be people who can discipline ourselves to be slow to anger? Why? Because as the scripture says, human anger does not produce God's righteousness. It is a hard lesson for some of us to learn because many of us, again, have been taught that it is aggression and physicality and anger that secures our safety. But I often ask folks, do you feel more safe when your anger overflows? And do the people around you feel more safe with all of the statistics around intimate partner violence, with all of the statistics around suicide, with all of the statistics around assault, my question to all of us is, how can we cultivate spaces and places where we can be, as the scripture says, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger? We'll keep reading verse number 22 of James chapter 1. It says, but be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty and persevere being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. I'm gonna come back to being blessed in your doing in a few minutes, but let's keep reading to James chapter number two. Our lectionary passage for today simply says this, my brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? Lord have mercy. For if a person with gold rings and in the clothes and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? Verse six, but you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? My God, today. Is it not they who drag you into court? 
Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, listen to this, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So whoever keeps the whole law but fails to keep one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who is shown no mercy. I just added an extra mercy just for good measure. Everybody say mercy, Lord. The word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to keep moving forward. Have you got good religion? And uh, let's just pray over the words of God that have been read to us. We say thank you, God, for the word that is a lamp unto our feet. Your word that is a light unto our path. Keep sending the anointing of God that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all said amen. Again, this book that is called James is one of the epistles, the letters that is often attributed to James, the brother of Jesus in a uh, kind of church history. He is called James the Just. He was one of, it is believed to be the last converts to the way of Jesus. Uh, it's kind of like that sometimes. How many know uh, your family can be the last people to accept that you got a good calling on your life. Hello, somebody. Amen. Isn't it, isn't it sad that sometimes some of your worst haters can be some of the people that are closest to you? And it's like, you know, everybody else, oh, man, you so great. And be like, mm, I don't know. They all right. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they just walked on water. I mean, I did that yesterday. <laughs> Nobody saw it, though, because people don't be want to look at what I'm doing. Uh, always taking up all the shine. I graduated from college, nobody came to my graduation. You know, it's just on and on and on and on and just hating, right? I'm not saying James was a hater, but he was the last person on the Jesus train. <laughs> and yet he became one of the most powerful and influential voices in the early church. He helped to continue to merge and to make sense of the kind of Jewishness, the uh, Torah, the practices, uh, the theological assumptions of the Hebrew, Israel, Jewish people through the Torah and all his teachings. And yet there was also a schism, a little disagreement that happened because you had Paul come onto the scene. And Paul was, even though a Jew, he was also out hanging out in the Roman Empire because he had other kind of family relationships as well. And so you had a little bit of a tug and pull between James and between Paul and what that has taught me as I've studied the faith, our faith, is that there is an always necessary tension within Christian faith. There are those who want to flatten Christian faith and lean into fundamentalism, lean into a rigid kind of reading and practice of our faith as if everybody has agreed all the time. I want you to know that one of the great things about Christian faith is that many followers of Jesus have not always agreed about everything. <laughs> you ought to clap your hands for that. Somebody say amen, right? Because that gives you and I a little bit of comfort that we don't always have to agree on everything. Some of the things we do agree on is Jesus. You ought to clap your hands for Jesus. Somebody say amen, right? Jesus is something we can agree on. But there are some intricacies, some, some, some doctrines, some, some, some other, other uh, kind of uh, cultural or personal preferences that, that get codified in a lot of our Christian faith. And the reason why we live in Christian community is so we can always with love, with generosity, with patience, with community, wrestle with that which we don't agree outside of the essentials. Now, we live in a country that has become so fundamentalist 
Now what's so interesting about fundamentalism, we have been socialized to believe that fundamentalism only shows up in Islam. With those kind of radical, fundamentalist, Islamic, jihadist terrorists. Right? And we, oh, we, aren't you glad we aren't like them? Aren't you glad we don't like, you know, just randomly kill people except when they driving down the street in a car by themselves and they get pulled over for a busted tail light and all of a sudden they end up dead on the street? <laughs> Aren't you glad that, you know, we don't like blow up towns and buildings except for like, you know, Black Wall Street in Durham, North Carolina, or Tulsa, Oklahoma, or, you know, uh, Philadelphia, Aren't you glad? I know where I'm about to go, right? You know, it's like we, we, we here in America, we, we, we be loud and wrong about what we don't do <laughs> in comparison to what other people do. But I have found that all of us are always in need of our own religious moral compass being checked by the Jesus standard of ethics. If I have my own standards, then I'm going to kind of, you know, grade myself on the curve. How many of you grade yourself on the curve when it comes to you? Like, you know, <laughs> if it's up to you, oh, the Lord knows my heart. <laughs> the spirit is willing. I say this all the time to people. Yeah, the spirit is willing. But it's so flesh. I'll tell you something about this flesh. It's weak. It's weak as a dog some days, right? And I just grade myself on the curve all the time. But isn't it interesting that when you grade yourself, grade yourself on a curve, you can't grade your neighbor with the same curve. You, I, mm. Anybody ever been harder on your neighbor than you've been on yourself? Anybody ever been harder on your partner than you've been on yourself? Harder on your children than you've been on yourself? I mean, I'm trying to just rein myself in as a parent. Because, you know, I was a mischievous child. Well, I was a curious child. <laughs> curious. Curious. Amen. I, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm speak positively into my past. Come on, man. Yes, sir. But I always had to have instructions. But I went into the store with my parents. Michael, keep your hands in your pockets. Like, why? Vesuvius, you know, just like, what is going on? Oh, wow. Every time I talk about what's happening, I'll be like, these kids, I love you, know, 40 years old, number nine. I used to be like, oh, our young people, they ain't got to work with our young people. Who's going to fight for our young people? Now I'm sounding like, these kids, what we doing to do with these kids? Graded on a curve, because how many of us used to be these kids? Some of us are still these kids. We just got older. I'm not here to mess with y'all too bad today. But the, the reality is that fundamentalism is not a pathway to freedom and liberation. You and I must make space for God to act freely within us and listen for others to react freely to God. Fundamentalism does not force people to respond freely. It breeds resentment. It breeds resistance. It is very counterintuitive. I had a pastor, Bishop, call me and you know, one who can support a candidate who is for abortion rights. 
I said, well, I am someone who definitely would love to see the number of abortions go down everywhere in the world. And so research says that countries that have the lowest number of abortions have three things at the same time. Abortions are legal and safe. Counterintuitive. Contraception is free and available to everybody. Come on. Mm. Counterintuitive and sexual education is taught yeah. right. to young people. Right. Counterintuitive. Yeah. If you, I told the pastor, if you are, if that's what your deal is, because pregnancies have been terminating, have been, uh, people have been uh, terminating pregnancies for the history of the world. This ain't just some new thing. What is new is that Jerry Falwell yes. and the conservative right yeah. in the 1970s yep. manufactured yep. abortion as a political wedge issue yeah. to try and build a movement to undo the civil rights gains of the 1960s. And there's books about that, but you know, you wouldn't know that if you don't read it. <laughs> You can listen to YouTube or you know, listen. Quick to listen. I think was that one of us one of the pillars. Yeah, quick to listen. Google it on the YouTube channel. Quick to listen. Get some more information in your coffer. But I said, okay, you know, hey, that may not be your thing. How about this? If I asked, I asked the preacher, if your wife, partner, daughter, beloved is having a Difficult, hard pregnancy to uh, that's threatening their life. Would you and your partner, your daughter, your wife, whoever, want to make that decision with your doctor and not some man you've never met in another part of the country has taken a decision? for the life and health of your family out of your hands. Now, you know, I can tell when I'm talking to preachers, that's why a lot of them don't like talk to me, when, I, when, 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 when dissonance is starting to set in. Like, oh man, this guy, he, he, he kind of know how to get me tripped up. Oh no, well, yeah, of course. I said, okay, so then you're for abortion. Oh man, oh no, I'm not saying, listen, I'm just telling you now. Because that's what it would be. I said, and even above all that, don't you want control of your own body? Just how about that? Because to me, the best way to ensure there are not unwanted pregnancies is for every man to get a vasectomy. Until they're ready to have some children. Because, you know, technology allows you to do that now. And then, you know, you get it back together. Then he, he said, oh, you a radical. I said, okay, well, God bless you, man. You know, I just, you asked me a question. I, I was going about my own business. Because, see, these are my own personal values, <laughs> preacher. What's my point? My point is, if you and I are going to be a part of this rich faith, we cannot allow fundamentalism to dominate the ways in which we come to relationship with God and with one another. I serve a God who's free. And I want the freedom that God has to be extended to me and to you. And I believe that the more you and I are formed after the ways of God, then everything that is of God, we talked about that last week, right? Every good gift comes from the source of lights. So if I'm free to grow into God's love, why would not I want that for my brother and my sister, my loved one? It's hard to be that free and be fundamentalist at the same time. That's why you better let go of fundamentalism. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I can't be so fundamental. I got to be free. And this is why the text 
talks about favoritism. Check your favoritism. Check your biases. Because the biases that you and I have will rob you and I of allowing the freedom of God to work among people you don't like. Now, I got to say, you know, people describe me as a progressive. I don't think I'm progressive. I just think, you know, I'm just a normal black man who's grown up in an anti-black, white supremacist world, and I just know, <laughs> amen, I know the devil when I see it, praise God. You can call it a progressive if you want to, amen, because, you know, there's some progressive folk out here. They love trees more than they love me. So I can't be no progressive. Somebody say amen. You hugging a tree, you won't hug me? <laughs> that don't work for me. And I'm not hating on no trees. <laughs> Hug them all you want to. But when you see me, I believe I'm worth more than a tree. Everything I learned about white supremacy, I learned them from white progressives here in the Bay Area. I didn't learn it from the Ku Klux Klan. I ain't met the Klan as much as I know. But the scriptures are so powerful, right? Because many people view favoritism as an interpersonal thing. I know I just gave you an interpersonal example, but when you read this text, this is one of the first, not first, it's one of the most powerful biblical descriptions of systemic and structural favoritism, bias. Can, I, can, can we just read a little bit more? Because, you know, sometimes we, you know, make everything so personal. But it says that if a person with gold rings and a fine clothes comes to your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes comes in, if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the other one who is poor, you stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil intentions? I will not read this as a personal interaction. I would read it as a systemic and structural critique against the preference and the dehumanization that is often at play between those of privilege and those without it. And that is a systemic and structural wickedness. Please believe me, when, 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 when our biases, our racism, our, 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 what's another word I wanna say? Our, our, our biases, our racism, and our prejudices, it's another good word, mm -hmm. When they manifest themselves through physical or interpersonal interactions, it is because we have been formed and shaped inside a system that has taught us that this person is less than human. This person does not deserve. And when we meet in communal spaces, we start to create hierarchies that can only be undergirded by systems. One person individually cannot oppress a people, but one person with a lot of systemic and structural power. Multiple people with a lot of systemic structure and power. And that is why, again, we keep reading verse number six, but realize, is it not the rich who oppress you? Now, again, I know this is a hard text for some of us who want to be rich. One of the greatest descriptions of wealthy elites I heard by Dave Chappelle. And he was talking about, many of you, everybody know who Dave Chappelle is? He's a f famous comedian, you know what I'm saying? You know, and you know, he was, his career had just taken off. And then all of a sudden he went to Africa and just disappeared. And I was like, oh, Dave Chappelle had a nervous breakdown. Maybe he did, I don't know, I'm not hating on it. You know, sometimes you can get in a situation, the pressure can just hit you and you're like, I, you know, I'm out of here. But that is some privilege because some of us can't go to Africa when we have a nervous breakdown. Like, man, we gotta sit in our house and Wait, wait till we get ourselves together. Go, go see if we're lucky. We have enough money to go see a therapist. We have insurance. We can go to you know a, 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 a health, a mental health, a group and process and and wait for our mind to kind of just decompress. I mean, you know, we got a lot of mental health stresses on this other side of COVID. That we ought to be gentle with ourselves. Patrick Seven said, I gotta be gentle with myself. I gotta be gentle with myself. But nevertheless, Dave Chappelle 
was being interviewed, and, and he said, you know, uh, you can make, I said, I thought I was rich, you know, I thought I was wealthy, thought, you know, I was somebody, you know. He said, but you can make enough money, and you'll meet real rich people. Now, this is in a stand-up comedy, comedy thing. Uh, and he said, and there's some white folks sitting there, he said, you know, because uh, uh, I became so, I was get, approaching so much wealth that I, I met some real white people. And some white person, he said, see, you think you're white. <laughs> he said, but I got so rich where I met the real white people. They put me behind, let me speak behind the curtain, and it scared me. I had to get out of there. The kind of rich that this scripture is talking about is not talking about you who making four hundred thousand dollars a year. Maybe you make a couple million, and if you're here, I hope you paid your tithes today. Somebody say amen. Consider it a charitable donation. Mm -hmm. But how many know there's some wealth in this world that sits in high places that. You and I may never know their name, but you, we will feel their oppression. And they oppress everybody. White, black, Asian, Latino, biracial, multiracial, educated, uneducated, living in the hills, living in the flatlands. This is who this passage is talking about. When it says, is it not the rich that oppress you? Why would you show favoritism to people, to systems that are actively taking the dignity and the image of God away from you? James is saying, listen, beloved, you and I ought to make sure that if we're going to prioritize doing good to anyone, we ought to do good to those who are poor. Quiet as it's kept, he's talking about you. <laughs> I know many of us don't want to say we're poor, but I know I'm poor. Man, I'm, I, I may not be as poor as some, but I'm poor enough. Man, because I got to go to work every day. Somebody say every day. If I don't go to work, something's going to fall to the ground. That's how you know you're poor. It's like, oh, I don't want to go to work. You know, some people ain't got to go to work. Be like, I'm just going to take the year off and get on a yacht. <laughs> Sail the world. All right, they, they, not, they, they may not be talking about you. But there is something for them people too. Because the scripture says that God blesses you so you can in turn be a blessing. So all of us got a burden to bear. But first we got to check our biases. Because if you don't check your biases, beloved, you and I can become people who are caught up in shrinking the circle of concern. So here's my first question. How do your biases, how do our biases keep us from extending belonging to those living outside the circles of our concern? Is there room for the thems? Not the dims, the thems, T-H-E-M-S. All the others that you've been taught to be suspicious of that you've been taught to have disdain for, the throwaways, the disposables. You can't have good religion if you're showing favoritism to the people that God has called you and I to make room for. I want you to know, beloved, that there's room at God's table for everybody. Literally everybody. I want you to think about this, again, in our theological kind of tradition, Satan, Beelzebub, Lucifer, used to sit at the table of God, was in the fellowship with God. If Satan can be in God's fellowship, <laughs> you don't have the power to exclude nobody. <laughs> Hello, somebody. You don't have that power. You may not like him, but dang, I got it. And that's hard for me, because there's people I don't, I, you know, I'd be like, I mm, know. No, no, no. <laughs> and God become McBride. <laughs> well, can they sit over there? <laughs> put put a, ten, 10 chairs between me and them. Because I, 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 I don't have it today. Anybody got something like that in your kind of imagination? 
But aren't you glad that the table is not yours to set? The table is ours to sit at together. Come, let us reason together. And in political season like this, it's very hard because folk just lose their minds. I got celebrity friends to be on, on social media saying the most outlandish things. I just say to myself, my goodness, where was you when there was no politic, you know, voting season? You was mighty quiet when this injustice happened, but all of a sudden now you got a ironclad political opinion about who's a witch and stuff and who's this. And I'm like, Lord have mercy. Your algorithms don't got the best of you. <laughs> Hello, somebody. I told someone today, you need to just give social media a rest until November 6th, because then all the algorithms won't be targeting your inbox. Because how many of you know that some of us don't even know that we are a victim of psyops? Psychological warfare. And what is at stake, beloved, if you and I don't stay in community with one another and continue as the scripture said, Lord, I love these verses, y'all. That's why I just can't, I can't, I can't get past, past it. But, 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 but it says, it says, uh, 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 verse number 21 of, of, of chapter number 21, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness. Listen, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. If you're not allowing the word of God through the community of God's people to kind of be implanted in your soul, you will be susceptible to the propaganda that's literally trying to steal your soul. That's trying to influence you towards sordid wickedness. I'm speaking as an individual. I got to tell you, the fact that Donald Trump... <laughs> Lord, help me today. ...is a viable candidate for the United States of America president sordid wickedness and rank growth that's what came to my mind when i read that oh pastor you shouldn't be political oh well, yes i should and you are too too because if we don't call out wickedness and guess what should kamala win we're gonna talk about her too we ain't gonna call her no names though i mean we don't talk about the office because the office of the president just like our government must be pushed and called into account for its own wickedness that oppresses the poor, that bombs folk in other countries, that displaces indigenous people, that allows wealth to be aggregated at the top. Our government has a lot of room to be critiqued. But I do believe, as the good old Methodist said, you can't have personal holiness without social holiness. So that means that you and I must also have a lifestyle that is within the, the, the ethical framework of Jesus. Lord, I'm talking so long, I'm going to have to wind up in a second. But let me, let me get this last point because I, I don't want to do uh, Have You Got Good Religion Part 4 next week. <laughs> Amen. But this passage is good to me. Amen. I, 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 I can stay in this passage for a little minute because it's challenging me. I'm telling you now, there's some people that I know that if I don't rely on God's spirit, on the challenges of scripture, then I can just write people off, people that I don't like. And when you write people off, you lose compassion. You lose care. You lose concern. You shrink your circle of concern to people that only like you, look like you. You become the algorithm. You create the echo chamber that reinforces. Everybody heard of confirmation bias? Yes. You just, oh, I knew I was right. You go around your life looking for things to prove you was right. No, beloved, you're not right all the time. You, you may not be right most of the time. None of the time. No. <laughs> just playing. You, you be right once, twice a day, man. <laughs> Third thing I will say from you today, verse number 12. So speak and act as though you are being judged by liberty and not the letter of the law. Simply this, beloved, resist judgment. 
lean towards freedom. Good religion means that you and I resist the urge to be judgmental, to be punitive, to be obsessed with consequences. The law is a guideline. It should be a compass, but it is not a weapon. And in our culture, we use the law. <laughs> Just think about it. I'm going to call the law on you. It's like the law. Who's the law? Well, you know who the law is. <laughs> we weaponize the law. The law is to be a compass, guidelines. The best way I like to say, I heard it described. Uh, how many of you ever driven on Highway 1 over those cliffs, like going up to somewhere, you know, you can, you know, you can be driving and they make a sharp turn. What, is it, what, is the, what does the cliff usually have on it? A guardrail. It's intended to make sure that you don't, what, go over the edge. That is what the law is supposed to be, a guardrail, to get you back on track. We've turned the law into a capitalistic, punitive, money-making enterprise. Right now, in the state of California, did you not know that slavery is still legal? Slavery is still legal if you are incarcerated. And some of our friends are pushing, and we're joining them, to pass Proposition 6, which would make slavery illegal in the state of California. Thank you for those 10 claps. Isn't it interesting that 2024, we still have on paper that slavery is legal. In a good old Christian nation. God bless America. Man. <laughs> Today is the first day, uh, Sunday of, what are they going to do? Uh, football. Niners don't play till tomorrow, so I ain't got to worry too much about the days. <laughs> But, you know, patriotism is just on display today. Everybody's singing how much they love America. And I'm not going to get on my rant about America today because it's just, you know, I've already said enough about many things today. But I want you to know, beloved, that in a so-called Christian nation in 2024, we're still trying to make slavery illegal for every human being in our country, oh, that, that kind of make me a little bit embarrassed. And guess what? <laughs> Formerly incarcerated people, people who are currently incarcerated were the ones that had to come tell me, because I didn't even know. I said, oh, that's not true, you radical. Ain't that something when you don't know something? And someone come and tell you something, your first thing is, oh, you a radical. <laughs> you, you, man, you just, you, just on, you just woke, you just too woke, go take a nap. <laughs> When you don't know something, we easily try to dismiss the person who's trying to enlighten us with some information we don't have as radical. Why? Because we don't want to bring them into our circle of concern. But sometimes God will send you people that will help educate you and enlighten you. And I'm here to tell you, beloved, that we have turned the law into a money-making enterprise rather than allowing it to be something that nudges us back into faithfulness. And so this text is clearly saying to you and I, as followers of Jesus who are committed to liberty and freedom, we have a choice. Resist judgment and punitiveness, which the law has been made synonymous with. It has been made to be described as, and let us lean into freedom and liberty. Freedom and liberty. Freedom means that I am free to and I am free for. Right? I'm free myself to make decisions, but I'm also free to be and to act, to serve. Freedom. When guided by the spirit of the guardrails, the law makes it easier 
for us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Makes it easier for us to care for creation and the environment. Makes it easier for us to care for the poor. Makes it easier for us to care for one another. Because I'm not overly obsessed with consequences. God help us to not be those kind of people. When tragedy happens, that we're first to say, that's God's judgment. I want to let you know something. So many people who believe that God's judgment is coming to America, and they may be right, we'll keep on living, but it won't be coming to America because of the last 10 years, 20 years. It'll be coming to America because for hundreds of years, this country has sold death and imperialism into the world. And I'm here to tell you, all of us better pray that God's judgment don't come, at least while we're here. <laughs> Wait till I get to Portugal or something. We get, 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 get to Cape Town, and I pray that it works out for them now because I'm taking my family with everybody, you know, we, all the way, get us a one-way ticket. <laughs> and then whoever, stay behind like the days of Noah. I've just prayed. No, I'm just playing. No, this is. I don't pray for judgment. I pray for mercy. And every follower of Jesus ought to always pray for mercy. Because there is none of us with clean hands. All this killing happening in Palestine, we didn't drop the bomb, but we show our, our tax dollars is all in them bombs. They now shooting folk, I and mean, they've been shooting folk, shooting, shot an a, a, a American peacemaker, shot the woman right in the head, trying to buffer herself between them and the soldiers. This is all on us. When I went there, I couldn't even ride on the road that my tax dollars paid for because I was with some Palestinians. You know, they got two road systems. Can't even ride on it. My hands, my money, our country's wealth, not just in Palestine, but in a whole bunch of other countries around the world. Oppressing. That is why I think this text is a challenge to all of us. Have you got good religion? Do you love everybody? Have you been to the water? Have you been baptized? Have you been converted? Has your life been changed? Have you got good religion? My prayer is that we can start saying, certainly, Lord, or help me, Lord. Lord, I want to have good religion. I want to have more faithful following of you. And the way that starts, beloved, is to first confess. God created me a clean heart. And renew the right spirit within me. Wash me. Somebody say, wash me, Lord. Stand to your feet, everybody. Say it again. Wash me, Lord. Say it again. Wash me, Lord. So I can be clean. I want to be a follower of Jesus in this time. Where people can say, man, that's the kind of Jesus... That is compelling. Not so I can get a pat on the back, but I want to be an ambassador for the Most High God. Everywhere I go, everywhere my feet step, I want there to be an expression of God's wonder, God's salvation, God's healing. And beloved, you don't have to wait till you're older. God needs you to be God's ambassador wherever you are. It ain't just on the preacher. It ain't just on the worship leader. It's on you. How many know that this week, more people will be met by the God you introduced them to? And they will be moved by the sermon I just preached today. Our lives are written letters from God. And so all that means is when you ask yourself, have you got good religion? On your job, with your family, with your children, at the school, in the neighborhood, when you're wronged, when you win, when you lose, what kind of God are you showing people? And when we drop the ball, beloved, our response ought to be, God, help me, forgive me, make my life a living sacrifice. 
God says, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Grab the hand of someone next to you. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my mouth. Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Anybody know that? Come on, let's just sing that together. If you can use, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. You can use me. If you can use anything, if you can use, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my mouth. Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. God, I pray for the hands that I'm touching today. I pray for the beloved who you have sent to be my neighbor in church today. God, I say thank you that we sit at your table, a table you set eternity ago. Thank you, God, that you welcome all who are willing to sit at this table. And I pray that as we sit at this table, God, you will remind us that we are your hands and your legs, your arms, your feet in the world. I pray, God, that the beloved I'm touching today will find peace through this embrace. We'll find spirit and hope and love through this embrace. We'll be someone, God, who can be unleashed and used in this season. God, I pray that you will be for them that which they cannot be for themselves. Be their salvation. Be their hope. Be their strength. Be, God, for them a light shining amidst the gloom. And we know that you are able to do it because you've done it so many times for us. So have your way, God. Now lift your hands. God, it's me and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father. It is not my sister nor my brother. But it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. I need your love. I need your joy. I need your peace. I need your power. I need your strength, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus that, God, you will create in us clean hearts. I pray, God, that we will shed those things that keep us from being faithful representatives of you in the world. I pray, God, that all the hurt and the harm and the trauma that this world invokes upon us will not dim the light that you are shining through us, oh God. I pray that the hands that are lifted will experience healing. Somebody say, heal me, Lord. I pray, God, they will experience salvation. Somebody say, save me, Lord. I pray that they will experience love. Somebody say, love me, Lord. And God, I pray that whatever is of concern to our family today, God, that it will be miraculously attended to. We pray for all those who are suffering around us and beyond us. Use us, God. May we have good religion. May we love our neighbors. May we, God, even learn to love ourselves better. And we'll give your name the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them, I got good religion today. I got good religion. I got good religion. I got it. I got it. I'm learning about it. I'm learning more and more about it. Clap your hands, everybody, and give the Lord a praise if you believe it today.